Hey guys, I'm Otero here back with a brand new video in Going Medieval. In this video, I will be attempting to just survive and relearn the game in 100 days. I am a little rusty with the game, so I just decided to play in normal settings of everything. I did, however, let fate decide on my settlers, their skills and talents, and the map seed, which later I think I regretted. Oh, and for funny, I played and will continue to play this mini series without pausing the game because you know, we know how important it is to pause and plan your base. So I did that to torment me a little bit. You can't always have the best of days now, can you? So without further ado, here's 100 days of going medieval. If you've watched my first series of this game, you know that I would always start my playthroughs with a small structure to protect our things, which I soon think to myself is very outdated. You'll see why later. Anyways, I started to put wooden floorboards under our things so they don't get muddy and dirty. Then I also put walls surrounding the area to serve as pillars for our roofs later. I then made a research table so we can learn new tech like wooden beams. However, I did notice that my starting whatever this is was too big and does not comply with the roofing mechanics of the game. So I just added some walls in the middle to fix that issue. I also gave my settlers the same work schedule and made each prioritize one role or colony needed. You know, in every colony sim game there is, I'm pretty sure that this, this is the most stressful one. I'm sure of it like a hundred one percent at the start of day two i focused some more on gathering materials i was also trying to plan for the end game like which technologies were necessities and which were not that important i think i planned for wooden weaponry stone block cutting and smelting not the best ones i believe but maybe soon when i've played for more than 200 hours maybe i can make a beginner's guide then i'm pretty sure i'm not the only one who's having a hard time mastering this game in the morning of day 3, not only did I ask my settlers to cut and gather more wood, but I also gave them the task to forage the nearby wild mushrooms. Not just to clear an area for our future stronghold, but because our food reserves are running low, and we wouldn't want our settlers to become rebellious at such an early stage. I've also made a butchering table in preparation for when we go hunting, which, now that I thought about it, didn't really happen until like winter. I later finally decided as well to just make the clearing I was talking about for our future base. So whether it was a young or an old tree, it was going to be made into planks, floorboards, and walls for our fort. And so cut and cut we go until the night of day 3. Oh, and I started to build roofs now because apparently they can't sleep on wet bedrolls. Okay, I honestly never knew that was a thing. In the morning of day 4, we finished the rest of the roofing and we also continued to gather the wood left on the devoirested area we did the previous day. It was also today that we finally started building our fort. Though, to be honest, this was not my proudest moment for a build. I didn't have much time to think about it and I was really focused on the goal of playing and surviving through 100 days. So the reason why I think the early game starting structure is outdated is mainly because one could have already started with the fort main base instead of building something temporary and soon to be demolished anyways which could have saved me time and resources to be honest just my own opinion for when you start your own playthroughs especially if you have a challenge in mind for my base design the concept was very basic really just one entryway the invaders would focus on and having an overlooking balcony or walkway for the archers to attack from when the invaders are destroying the front door oh we also got our first merchant here on day 5, I traded extra materials and resources the colony had for a chicken. Keep in mind that this recording was still pre-experimental branch patch where livestock within the range of your settlers and other pets are protected from wildlife. And so right after I got the chicken, it was being attacked and killed by a polecat. Yep, wasted resources for nothing. And the funny thing is, I actually never noticed the chicken was killed because I was too focused on building the base. So I'm happy with that patch update. It only made sense. Good job, devs. 
For the rest of days 5, 6, and the morning of day 7, we worked on the fort and moved in our animals, resources, workbenches, research table, and beds. In the afternoon of day 7, as we were moving and settling in our new fort, an escaped prisoner, Anwind, would seek help and refuge from the colony as he was about to be burnt alive. Even though he may be pursued by the disciples, the colony accepted him with open arms and prepared for the search party's arrival. Plus, an extra pair of hands would always be good for the colony. Welcome, Anduin, to the colony. I wish there was an amazing story to tell you during the eighth day, but no, nothing. The colony just existed one more day closer to the 100-day goal, building the third floor of the fort. As the search party was now imminent, I mentally prepared myself for the colony's incursion. Archers on the wall and melee at the doors. That was the plan. This is it. The Ancrean disciples have finally arrived and asked for Anduin, and even had the audacity to threaten burn Dornfern to the ground. Oh, we'll show them. As they marched towards the fort, as planned, I put two archers on the walls to be able to shoot down at whoever was knocking the doors, and even if they were successful at knocking it down, we had two melees ready to face them on the field. My archers continued to rain down volleys of arrows at the backs of the invaders, guaranteeing victory with no casualties whatsoever. Later that night, I also started to instruct my settlers to expand downwards as we prepare for summer. Because in summer, everything outside was hot and everything underground was colder. On day 10, it was back to the usual tasks. Cut trees, gather wood, and continue finishing the fort. On day 11, aside from doing the usual tasks, we also started the garden. Though, in my opinion, I should have started on the first day or the soonest time that I can as gardening can really help with the food production. Though, in my opinion, again, farming is only good as for early game. Unless it was farming herbs, then it would have been a necessity all throughout one's playthrough. But for late games or long runs of playthroughs, I must admit that beekeeping is king. I'll get to that point eventually. On the 12th day, we finally finished the exterior of the fort. Again, not my proudest moment for a building I've done. But it was something to keep my colony protected from intruders. However, the question remains, will it continue to serve its purpose for protecting us against wildlife and incursions for the remaining 88 days? I guess we'll have to find out in the upcoming days. I started day 13 with our basement expansions since the day also marks the first day of summer. And if our food were not properly stored in a cooler place, then they would spoil faster than they usually would. Now admittedly, I am kind of late with the expansion here. Ideally, you should already have a storage for food and other resources that would spoil due to extreme heat in the basement even before summer hits. Maybe instead of building that temporary shelter, I could have spent it digging instead. On day 14, I spent the whole day working on the basement expansion. As you can see, I have already started digging towards the mountain at the back of my base because I thought of having sort of a sunken garden so that my settlers wouldn't have to go outside of the fort once in a while to do their gardening. On day 15, I'm still working on the basement expansion and one could really use an extra pair of hands here. And these tasks are just taking way too long to finish. Luckily for us, later that day, a stranger was spotted over the edge of Dornford, and it seemed that the stranger needed our help as he was bleeding from a deep gash and needed to rest. This one, however, did not warn us of anyone after him, and so we welcomed him into our little settlement. Welcome to Dornford, Christian. Even before Christian arrived, we already had a problem with food production, and in effect, some settlers were becoming annoyed. And just in the neck of time, our cabbages were ready for harvest. We should get these cooking fast. On day 16, we also started producing limestone bricks, one of the two tougher endgame materials used for buildings. Initially, I thought of just fortifying the basement walls with limestone bricks, so my upper levels were not just sitting on dirt foundations. Then, what I wanted to do was to change the exterior walls with some material, but alas, such a task was too much for my little colony right now. Especially since I still have a lot of resources out and about, I really had to put that idea aside and just continue to work on the basement expansions. Day 17 was spent once again expanding the basement. It was really taking the colony a while since most, if not all, 
the expanding tiles were made from stone. Plus, I was doing the dig section by section. I didn't want to risk having a collapse in the middle of the fort. With just a few more tiles to dig out, we have finally finished the first part of our basement expansion. And since the stone cutting workbench was already here, I decided to make it into a workshop. So all of my future workbenches would be located here so that all of them will get a small production boost from the room type. And we never really had a surplus on food, so I never really got the urgency to build the food storage immediately. On day 19, I was adding and calculating the number of chronicles needed per tech, so I would know how much the exact total amount we needed to get further down the tech tree. But little did I know that the ones I was actually accounting for were not really for the economic sustainability of the colony, but rather militaristic and more on expansion. Once that was done, I kept on expanding the sunken garden portion of the fort and planted trees as well near our temporary vegetable patch right outside the fort. And thanks to our little cabbage patch, we have finally stopped having issues with our food reserves being low. And once more for the rest of this day, it was spent on digging and expanding the sunken garden up until day 21. But on day 21, we also started expanding another level downwards into having a little quarters area so that my settlers wouldn't have to sleep where the materials and resources were temporarily being held. It was just getting way too cramped and I know my settlers wanted to get a little sense of privacy while they sleep. Though there was a factor I never accounted for, which really got most of my settlers feeling bad. You'll have to keep on watching to find out what it was. On day 22, I let my colony run on its own, having a lot of tasks lined up for them to do. I just sat back and kept on thinking what else my colony would need. I took this time to replan and even did my research on which tech would be most beneficial to the late game. Is what I would say if I was not just letting time pass on while I was on my phone scrolling through Facebook and Instagram. On day 23, we were finishing off the sleeping chambers. We have also put torches on the walls not just to light up the area but also to provide warmth for our settlers in the basement. Hmm, it's been awfully quiet and I can't shake this feeling that our settlement is being watched from a distance. Well, speaking of, it appears we've been visited by bandits the progeny of the plague. They wanted slaves, they demanded blood, and they wanted to pillage Dornford, to which I say, come and get them. As soon as the incursion starts, I've always had the strategy of having archers on the walls and melees at the doors, and up to this day, it's been foolproof. But I guess I underestimated this guy carrying a battering ram who instantly knocks down the door and almost killing Baudry. Good thing Gewis Gewis? G I don't okay, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I'm just saying Gewi. <laughs> Good thing Gewi was keen as ever as he just kills the guy, giving us the victory, making the last of the bandits escape for his dear life. We're lucky enough only a door was broken down and no major casualties occurred. On day 24, aside from receiving a merchant, nothing important happened on this day. We spent most of this day just like any other day, finishing buildings, mining, and gathering other resources like wood and food. And just like that, another season ends. Only 76 more days before we reach our goal of surviving 100 days. Only time can tell now if we're prepared for the unknown that is yet to come. On day 25, I mainly focus on expanding the quarters in preparation for newcomers in the long run, because so far, We've been getting at least one new settler per season, and 100 days as 8 seasons and 4 days in going medieval. So you get the math here. And plus, just so we don't waste much time in the future, at least when they do come, we can just plop down a bed ready for to be used instead of taking more time in digging and mining out a room for them. I also expanded to a small storage room here. I initially thought of making it a seed storage because it would be near the sunken garden, it makes perfect sense, my settlers wouldn't have to travel far to get new seeds to plant. But then I eventually shifted it to become a storage for animal carcasses instead, since it would also be near the underground kitchen. Plus, I never knew seeds could actually rot in extreme heat, so I had to put the seeds in the colder place than this. On the morning of day 26, they have started building the small shed on the back. And again, if you have watched my previous playthrough with Going Medieval, 
I always want to add a little something to this game. So as for the roof of this small shed, I didn't just want to make it out of limestone brick or a roof or whatnot, but instead I used sticks. More importantly, or more specifically, a stick floor. Having a patch of limestone brick floor would just feel weird, and putting stick floors instead made it more natural looking. Well, to me at least. I mean, I could have even put a stick stockpile on top of it if I wanted to kick it up a notch. Hmm, or maybe I should. Maybe in the future. But for the remainder of days 26 until 28, I just expanded our underground basement yet again to make the kitchen. Oh, and I also made kins and the smokehouse at the back as well. On day 29, I think I might have left my computer for a bit, but I just mined through the small mountain at the back so we can further expand on the sunken garden. Halfway through autumn, and we haven't really done anything noteworthy yet. We just lived and existed one more day in day 30, expanding the sunken garden. Day 31, we finally finished digging through the kitchen. You know, I wish there was a rule or a system when doing certain tasks, especially for digging or even building a multi-story building, wherein instead of having the settlers work on anything they want to, you can assign which tiles are they going to dig first, instead of having to do it section per section. I mean, I get how these types of games are meant to be very micro managey, but for me, just a personal preference, something like that would really help a lot in getting things done. We have also started making our fermentation room and our great hall. I know you might be thinking, why not just leave your ales and brews in the kitchen to ferment? Don't they need heat to ferment? Does it not get hot in the kitchen so they can ferment? Okay, that sounded way too kinky. Anyways, it does get hot, but it gets way too hot to the point that it could go bad instead of fermenting. That is why I made a whole new room for them. And this way, I could control the temperature to make it the best environment for fermenting my ales and brews. Somewhere between 3 to 6 degrees is the sweet spot. Anything less, they won't ferment, and anything more would spoil. Anyways, as my settlers were about to clock in for the night, something unexpected happened. Yep. A night raid. What a great way to disturb the body clocks of my settlers. Alright boys, time to get up and defend our fort. Okay, I have no idea how that went through and hit my own settler. That must be a minor bug of some sort. Also, I hope in the future we get training stands like archers can get an archery range target, which can be made out of wood and hay. And for melees, a uh, dummy target, which is obviously made out of wood, of course. Just so there's an easier and faster way to train their archery and melee skills, and not just during incursions, which happens quite rarely. Just, just a thought. Another, another personal preference. You know, I hope this particular clip ends up being watched by a developer of Foxy Voxel. It's a free idea, guys. Hope it gets considered. Anyways, as they manage to break through the fort almost leaving both of our melee soldiers good for dead. With one last hit from Baudry, victory was yet again ours. We focused yet again on our expansions of the fermentation room and the Great Hall. We finished early in the Great Hall, but then again, we still needed to build those wooden beams. We wouldn't want the higher floors to collapse on us, hence the funky looking mined out sections. As we were working on the Great Hall, Dornford had a new visitor someone who actually wanted to help us out with these endless diggings and to whom we returned the warm smile and open arms. Millicent, you've found yourself a safe place to call home. Welcome to the colony. It was also only on this day that I decided to make our underground freezer. Two seasons late, but better late than never, I suppose. I mean, our colony never really had the issue of overproducing food, and quite the opposite in fact. So, nothing grand yet, just a small piece of expansion for a freezer. On day 34, we just existed yet again, but finally finished mining through the rest of the Great Hall and the freezer. On day 35, we started with working on our new tables and chairs, so that our settlers could finally enjoy their food and ale while sitting down and enjoying each other's company. The last day of autumn. I didn't do much expansion on this day, as most previous tasks were already finished, so I let my settlers run their own lives doing tasks they thought important for the colony. I just watched from a distance as they all slumbered asleep, waking up the next day to our first winter. And it was finally winter. And the first task at hand was to build shelves for all the meat we'll get, since in winter we cannot grow plants, so we have to start hunting for our food. 
and as well as to expand our freezer just a little bit. The first snow and everyone woke up feeling warmth and joy in their hearts receiving a small boost of happiness to start the day. I guess that's the impact of seeing the first snow. We don't get winters here in the Philippines so you know I wouldn't really know. Never even experienced snow in my whole life. Sad face. Anyways forget about my sad life. I know how harsh winters here can get as well. That's why I never asked my settlers to do so much work outside the fort. So we will be focusing now on researching. And it got me thinking. I can't just waste the season not doing anything. And besides, we are technically a fort with underground expansions, meaning we were never technically going outside for work and labor. And so the idea of building a library came to mind. And so on day 39, we started with the library expansions, something to boost our researchers with while they wrote chronicles, textbooks, and theses about the life we have here in Dornford. We also made ice boxes to produce blocks of ice to keep our freezer cold even after winter to preserve all the meat we would get from our hunts. I honestly don't get the animation here. <laughs> Can someone explain in the comment section what they're supposed to be doing here? On day 40, we have finished making our library. All that's left is to add the research tables and we can finally start with the hours and hours of writing. I've also started on expanding the storage room for the bookshelves quite quickly and looking back at it now, I could have worked on something else since that expansion was not needed yet. On day 41, I was also just reminded that there was now a beauty factor to the moods of the settlers and having low-end materials for floors and walls in places where they would always be tend to give their mood let only a few bonus points unlike if high-end materials were used such as the clay brick or the stone brick. And so I remodeled our sleeping chambers by replacing the stick flooring with clay brick flooring and adding stone brick floors to the common areas, the library, and the workshop. While we were out hunting with Millicent, she caught a track of something different from what she was hunting. Eager and determined to find out what it was, she followed the tracks into the wilderness. Soon enough, she hears sticks crackling and bushes moving, and to her astonishment, she found a runaway that was borne away by shining knights against her will. She slipped away at night and traveled barefoot on rough and broken roads to get away from her captors. Without any hesitation, don't worry, Millicent says as she promises to help her out. Welcome to the colony, Barbada. And so for day 43, we barely did any work as we prepared for the incursion as their arrival was imminent. And soon enough, the knights of the Circle of Avalon arrived at the outskirts of Dornford asking for the head of Barbada, to which Millicent says, over my dead body, as she promised to help Barbada in her time of need. The incursion starts and it didn't take long for Millicent to draw the first bloodshed, as she's the first to greatly injure an enemy, failing to finish the deed. Despite this, she did, however, take out the invader's sole archer from a distance, and all that was left were the knights, and Dornford had already been in this situation, even far worse than this. So there was nothing new to us. Come on Osgood, whose side are you on? The enemy kept on trying to beat the door down, but we kept volleying arrows from all directions to whoever tried to knock it down. And with one killing blow from Christian, victory was secured, and Dornford was safe once again. Barbada thanked Millicent for keeping her word and fighting bravely, to which Millicent just smiled back, hugged her, and said, you're safe now. Now we didn't do much for day 44, we just worked on our chronicles, built another research table so we can start writing thesis, hunted, chopped trees for wood, pretty much just lived another day closer to our 100 day goal. Likewise on days 45 and 46, we just worked on producing chronicles, textbooks, and thesis as I was nearing the 50th day mark and I was nowhere near the end game items such as crossbows and the iron plate armor. And fun fact, as I was writing the script and made a search for the name of the armor, I came across this. There's steel and gold plate armor now? Has there always been? They never really tell you in the research tab, but I guess that's what the steel and gold bars are for. And I think it's time to revisit the game of mine. Maybe a day 101 to 200 video next? Do let me know in the comment section below if you want to see that. On day 47, I added a sewing station, armorer stable, and eventually a blacksmith as well to finish our little workshop station. Alas, it was the last day of winter, day 48. We focused on producing armor for our settlers to better prepare ourselves for future incursions. Expanding the freezer because why not? And remodeling the great hall again because why not? 
But winter was not done with us because on the last day, some way, somehow, severe frost turned the ground to iron, ruining planted crops. Trees split, birds froze to death, and rivers became solid ice. It was vital for the settlers to dress warmly and heat Dornford's sleeping quarters to evade the deathly kiss of cold. It was a cold snap. One can only hope to see the light the following day. Day 49. It's not only spring, but also marking a new year in Dornford. And what better way to celebrate our anniversary with a feast? That's why our first task of the day is hunting. But that didn't last long because we were missing terribly. Anyways, back to our Chronicle production. We just kept on producing and producing books for our research. Because tomorrow marks half of the goal of surviving for 100 days. And we have not reached any late game tech yet. And finally, we've unlocked the crossbow tech. One of the late game items in going medieval. I mean, sure, you can loot them from the corpse of the invaders. But personally, I prefer to make my own. Wait, what's this? Oh man, I forgot the mechanical components were needed to make crossbows, so that means we need to research blacksmithing, something I could have researched way back in days 10 to 20. Oh well, time to hit the books again. So you probably already know what we did on day 50. Yep, mass production of books. Until finally, we researched blacksmithing. Once that was built, we tried making the mechanical components, but Little did I know that it needed a requirement and only found out about it a couple of minutes later since Millicent had smithing 8 and was quite passionate about smithing, I then chose her to become the colony's blacksmith. And so let me explain what I was doing here. So in order to train one smithing skill, one shall make something using the smelter, blacksmith, or armorer's workbench. So I made an automatic routine for Millicent. First, in the production queue is to smelt down any available items for metal, and this shall be done forever. Once that's done, assuming she meets the required threshold to produce the mechanical components, then she will begin to produce the set amount of components. If not, then we go with the third priority on the list, which is with any available metal in our storage, she will be using them to make a short sword which will be done until we have one in our storage, which I'll eventually change later on. So the reason why I didn't want to set an amount for the short sword is because I want her to continuously make them for as long as resources are available. And the reason why I didn't want her to make them forever is because I didn't want her to be stuck in that production queue of just making and making swords and eventually having so many swords we won't be using. So with this logic, once she produces the short sword, we would have reached the required amount of 1, and so she'll stop producing them, and then she'll go back to work on the first production queue, which is to smelt down any available items into metal, i.e. the short sword we just made. And this would be in an automatic loop until she's able to make the mechanical components we need. I hope that made some sense. I'm pretty sure most of the players do this as well. And now only 11 more to go. Alright, I'm not gonna lie here, but for days 52 until 58, which is technically the whole of spring, look, I'm not getting lazy or tired of editing here, okay? But I am sparing you guys of repetitive actions and details that happens in the game. But anyways, for the rest of days 52 to 58, aside from our continuous production of chronicles, textbooks, and theses for new texts, we did just that, focus on leveling up Millicent smithing to 20, and Anwin's carpentry to 20 as well because apparently making a crossbow requires that much skill too. So we can finally get our own set of crossbows and turn our simple archers into crossbowmen. And if you have to ask or just simply curious, I just did the same thing with the automatic routine. This time instead of metal, it's wood for deconstructing and making bows. We also did some micro hunting here and there just to entertain myself because I've been hearing hammering and sawing for the past few game days and I was getting tired of just watching them hammer and saw. There were also instances where we would run out of iron ingots to produce short swords so occasionally we would have Millicent focus on smelting the iron ores we have into iron ingots. As we were doing our automatic routines, one of our hunters reported that they found something in the woods. A maiden that was found fainted on the floor, bleeding from seems to be a minor accident. 
No signs of bandits whatsoever, just an axe and shattered lumber. Clearly a sign of wood cutting mishap. Lucky for you, our colony already has lumberjacks, but we can still use an extra pair of hands. Plus, my conscience would kill me to just leave her in the wilderness to die of blood loss. And so, Rosia, welcome to the colony. Just two more levels for Anwin and six more levels for Millicent. We got to keep on moving. I just can't wait for us to have late game weapons and armor. And as spring was about to end, human figures appeared in the outskirts of Dornford. Eyes hollow, hair wild, rancid stench, and daubed with blood. The river bandits have taken arms and are ready to attack Dornford. There was no reasoning with them out of this. Only bloodshed was imminent. And so we shall fight in dusk. We have learned her from our mistake, this time around strengthening our main door with iron to be able to withstand the attacker's battering ram. They were just no match for our archers, they fell one after the other, until victory was in an arm's reach. Not even their battering ram was able to do much damage to our front door. And with one last volley, victory was secured as Barbada killed one of the bandits. The remaining bandits have fled and retreated to where they came from. I let them live to tell the tale of the unbreachable gates of Dornford. Or they can try again someday to prove me wrong. The sun shining as bright as ever signifying that it was already summer. Only 40 more days before we've reached our challenge. So we continued to work on getting our first crossbow. Aside from that, the sunken garden has been a long project of ours and it's about time we get some of our idle settlers to start mining again. I really want to get that garden up and running, so for the rest of day 62 to 64, we expanded. We also started to dig through the floor. My plan was to change the current stone, silver, and iron tiles into dirt so we can use that area for farming. And we continued to work that through day 65 to 67. Oh, and I've also tried to outline the fencing for the garden already. And with one side of the area usable for farming, we went ahead and converted it to our new garden. This way, our settlers don't have to go outside of the fort to do their garden duties. Remember when I said beekeeping was king? Yeah, we're going to put 10 of these bad boys. Five on each side of the garden. And maybe even more when I revisit the save game. So, why do I say it's king? Well... This is just my personal opinion. With beekeeping, one hive can produce, I believe, an estimate of 45 honey. Now in my case, if I have 10, I can roughly produce 450 jars of honey. And honey can be used both in food production or in the latter state of the game, distillery. Not only that, but using beekeeping also increases one skill of animal husbandry, which is useful for taming animals. And the only downside I see to it is it takes maybe a day and a half or two full days before you can get the honey. Which I believe you can just offset with the number of beehives in your settlement. Unlike with planting, and I've tried and tested this in this playthrough alone. 1. Seeds. If you can't get seeds, you can't plant. And 2. There's a risk of your plants getting eaten by your pets. Even if the plants are behind fences. Or maybe I'm just doing something wrong, I don't know. I'm just basing this from my experience as of the late. Oh, and you can't plant during winter. Now, the weather does affect the production of the beehive, but then again, you can offset this with the number of beehives you have in the settlement. Oh, and have I mentioned blighted crops? So yeah, I hope I got my point across to you guys. Again, just my personal preference. Day 69 is also something special. Go ahead, take a guess on why it's special. If you guessed something in relation to the sleeping chambers, then you're absolutely correct. <laughs> and trust me, I didn't plan this. This sort of just happened and thought about this script as I'm writing it. But anyways, this is also the day I changed all the walls in the underground basement, starting with the sleeping chambers from dirt into clay brick walls. Because like I said, the nicer the environment is for your settlers, the happier they become. And having dirt as walls is not very aesthetic to the settlers. And so begins our major revamp project of our walls. And of course, I had to do this section per section because I didn't want to cause a cave-in and risk losing some important things on the upper levels. So bear with me as this project will last quite a while. 
And so we dug, and we built simultaneously. Look how when I dig, it's affecting the palisades already. Hence why I dig in sections, as to prevent bigger cave-ins. Though, I'm not gonna lie, I like the effect of that. It sort of brought life to the exterior of our fort. It sort of looked ruinish. I love it. I'm keeping it until it's destroyed. Nothing really new here, just more of Project 69 until the end of summer 1354. On the first day of autumn, also on the second day of autumn, I just continued with working with Project 69. I unfortunately ran out of clay on day 75 and so I got a team to mine some more. My stockpile for mined resources was such a mess that I also organized them in such a way that one stockpile would only contain one type of raw material. Again, for day 76 to 77, I just gathered more clay for our Project 69. And then one rainy afternoon, on day 78, we were raided yet again. This time, however, our enemies were a tad bit stronger than the usual threats we've dealt with because they brought with them catapults. And mind you, our first level and second level of our fort were still made from wood. But nonetheless, we faced them with all the courage we had. As I tried to position my archers on the walls, rocks started to fall down on our fort. Now, I don't know if this was pure luck, but the enemy's catapult shot accidentally hits their own men, doing at least 10% damage to a few of their troops, assisting us our first kill. Despite this misfire, they continued to penetrate our walls with their catapults. Fortunately for us, our walls were holding, and we managed to cut down their soldiers one by one until we've secured the victory. And as we were about to call it a night on day 79, we were abruptly disturbed with loud banging on our door. A stranger goes by the name of Adam. He says that he was being hunted by an alchemist and is asking for our help to fight off his cronies that were pursuing him. And, well, we were already awakened by this. And plus, we just won our previous incursion. So I say bring it on, and welcome to the colony, Adam. On day 80, aside from preparing Adam's room, we barely did anything else really. There was an incursion to arrive in a few hours, and we've already finished most of the work in the fort. So I just took this time to look at everything we've done so far, thinking of what else to do after the incursion. And in the morning of day 81, as our settlers were just about to get up from their sleep, the Society of the Fellows finally arrived asking for Adam. The incursion starts and my settlers were feeling good. We're slaughtering them one by one as usual. I felt good because we've just won the previous incursion not too long ago. And well, that got the best of me as I forgot to draft Adam himself. And I noticed it when he went out of the fort while the incursion was already taking place. In my panic, I drafted him quickly and asked him to go straight back inside the walls of the fort where it was safe. But unfortunately, everything was too late, and all the enemies were right behind Adam, and with one swing from the battering ram, Adam was dead. Despite being with us for just one day, we didn't want his death to be in vain, and so we honored Adam by fighting with all our might, killing each and every single one of them. It was the only right thing to do to avenge his death. I really wasn't prepared for this, and so I didn't know where else to put his grave. Maybe if the game permits, I can make a crypt where my fallen settlers would eventually go as they leave this pixelated world of theirs. And maybe I can also transfer the grave of Adam there. Despite their recent victory, the settlers can't help but still feel at lost, especially with the loss of one of their comrades, despite knowing him for just one day. Farewell, Adam. On day 82, I also started to make a more private and more quiet place for my settlers to worship their deities. And so, I made one room for the Constitutionists and one room for the Oak Brethren. But for day 83, I wanted to get to the Ladium armor and weapons first. And sometime down the road, Millicent already reached the Smithing 20 threshold. And so we just laid back and watched as Millicent started to produce the mechanical components needed for the crossbows. And finally, on day 84, we've done it. We've made our first crossbow. Unfortunately, another threshold was needed to get my settlers to actually use this one and the skill of 15 or more on archery. Up to this day, I still have no idea how I can train my archery as fast as one would hope other than to use it to attack or hunt animals. Again, I wish there was a way for me to train them like maybe shooting a target or some sort 
you know just to speed up the process because we only get so much animals spawning in our lands and we only get a few bandit raids here and there so training archery would really be one of the most consuming ones in my opinion at least or maybe that would be too imbalanced i'm not sure but you know devs free idea <laughs> needless to say we finally promoted two of our archers into heavy arbalests these by the way are customized and just in case you're wondering a, a heavy arbalest wields a heavy crossbow and uses heavy armor just for the sake of the role playing concept of an rpg game now i can finally say we are more than prepared for what is to come in the remaining 16 days of this playthrough day 85 it was winter yet again and the first task of the day was to save the crops that were growing in our little garden later that day we also expanded on the brewery area and did some more of project 69 on our great hall and this carried on until day 86 and day 87. on day 88 i tried to train more of the archers skill by manually hunting the wildlife didn't want the risk of losing yet another settler to wolves boars or even bears on day 89 i worked on redoing the entryway to the freezer because i initially thought that the distance of the freezer to the great hall was so near that the heat from the great hall was going towards the freezer hence it was not getting too cold in the freezer but i guess for future reference i just had to dig it deeper maybe because the ice cubes were not really helping that much and the new entryway didn't make much difference as well our fort is getting overwhelmed with livestock i'll have to do something about that eventually here's the worshiping area expansion i was talking about so like what i said one room for restitutionists and one room for oak brethren and with only nine days until the end of this challenge i really had no time to make a more beautiful place of worship unlike in my other series where i built a church and a temple so two small rooms would do for now it took me one whole day to dig out the rooms and another half to furnish them but on day 93 we finally made the new places of worship and our settlers would have a quieter place to worship and not beside the livestock on day 94 i noticed as well that my freezer was getting way too cramped and so i decided to expand on it one last time and as well as to apply project 69 on it and just so we're clear project 69 is to turn the dirt walls into clay brick or stone brick walls it's very wholesome i promise it just so happens that it happened on the 69th day and we did this with the new entryway to the freezer as well on day 95 and on day 96 as we finished the beautification and expansion of the freezer i look back to this winter as this was the nicer winters we've had no cold snaps no sounds of bells jiggling and ass cheeks clapping from bandits who want to enslave or kill us just pure relaxation only four more days until we've reached the end of our challenge on day 97 we can't end this challenge not beautifying everything and so i took this time to beautify the entryway as we mentioned not too long ago day 98 i even put this beautiful marble statue made by one of our settlers on day 99 since it was one last day before the end of this challenge i knew i was going to miss the sounds of picks mining and axes chopping so i gathered more clay from the mines and wood from our mini forest i'll surely miss this also in all of my hours of playing this game not once have i ever made a cartography so i'll get into that day 100 and wow i think i've missed something here just look at the world our influence can eventually go to now it got me thinking of a possible day 101 to 200 challenge or maybe a whole new challenge should do something with influence maybe why don't you type in the comment section below and let me know what you what you guys think you know uh, what what tickles your fancy let me know oh and look at that somebody joined at the last second want to help eh all right then welcome to the colony sibyl so as day 100 slowly passes by i just want to take this time to thank you you who have watched throughout this big project of mine it took me maybe over 70 or 80 hours or so to video edit make the script and to voice record and edit once more this really was not an easy task and i'm glad i got to take on this challenge at least now i know that i can prove to myself that i can do it i can do anything if i set my mind to it and not just me even you whatever you're going through you can do it you just have to have hope and faith even just a little bit 
have faith in yourself because on bad days when you can't count on nobody else you have yourself and exactly don't give up for goodness sakes never ever give up if you get tired learn to rest but never quit if you've made it this far into my video promise me that and i won't quit with you from a statistical view i'm almost near my goal of 1k subs but it's still far far as can be and 4k hours watch is very daunting too but i know i'll get there someday just as long as i don't give up anyways i didn't know who needed to hear that or maybe it's for me sometime in the future i can look back to this video and maybe someday i can thank myself for not giving up or maybe keep myself pushing some more who knows only time can tell now anyway as always if you've enjoyed this video i'd appreciate it if you guys dropped a like on the video and you might as well consider subscribing to the channel as it helps me out a lot and yeah let me know in the comments below if you'd like to watch a part two of the 100 day challenge i.e the day 101 to 200 or a totally new challenge in going medieval so far all that i thought of are a melee only challenge and a john snow challenge where we start with one guy who doesn't know anything at all other than melee of course and you reference of the game of thrones character john snow or you know if you have any other challenge in mind that you'd like me to do let me know in the comment section below as well and i'll definitely take a look at them Anyways, uh, thanks again, and it's been a pleasure to be with you guys. And yeah, that's it for me for today. I'm Aimatero, and I'll see you guys on the next video.